Dette er den ukentlige nyhetssendingen fra Europa. Every day they used to be sitting there for magic potions, destroying me friends, stealing his world. Okay, then show. Right. Yeah. Yep, amazing stuff. Yeah. So. And part Edward. three of the show then. Um, the show. Where do we start? I was thinking, do you think we should put um, uh, John Lennon and Donald together because they talk about similar things and uh, to do with activism in Ireland and uh, they both touch on the uh, Shell story and then we'll come back uh, and have a little talk before Jerry, I think, uh, our, uh, our protester who's been released from... Uh, from captivity. Okay, so I'll I'll, I'll steam on then with uh, this uh, great show you done with John Lennon earlier today. I might add. All right. Uh, today we have uh, John Lennon, um, who's come in very kindly uh, this early Sunday morning uh, to discuss with us the uh, action at Shannon Airport at the um, uh, air air uh, show. And um, I'll, I'll just very quickly go into that because John is short for time. Uh, welcome to the show, John. Uh, could you give us a, a sort of a, a synopsis of what happened yesterday and how it was received by the public? Well, thanks for having us on again, Sean. Um, we're delighted with the opportunity we had yesterday at Shannon to bring our message of the, the horrors of war and the U.S. military use of Shannon to probably 30,000 people or so as they drove in or walked in to, to the air show. There were a couple of fighter planes in the air show, and we made the point that war is not fun and entertainment. War is, is brutal and horrific for, for the people who are living in war zones. And the main message that we also delivered to people was that Shannon has the proud history and a record of civilian aviation, which was being celebrated yesterday, 70 years, duty-free started at Shannon, so on and so forth. But one of the horrible scars on the history of Shannon that is not being talked about and is not being highlighted is the fact that the U.S. military, two and a half million troops, plus their weapons, have been going through Shannon for the last 15 years. They've been going to, and they were involved in the invasion and occupation of Iraq, which was illegal. They were involved in the invasion and occupation of Afghanistan, which was not properly um, supported by a UN mandate. There has been ongoing conflict in the Middle East, in places like Syria and Libya and so on, which, again, the US and its allies have been involved in. And all of the troops and all of the, a lot of the stuff that's been used to create the destruction and what's been happening in the Middle East has been coming through. Shannon and nobody's talking about it so we were there with our banners with our barrier um, our, our displays um, red balloons you'll I'm sure remember the, the song Nina's song 99 red balloons which was an anti-war song which we called on as well and we got a great response from people that's one of the lovely things about yesterday we got a couple of dissenting voices who told us to, to go away and stuff but by and large, almost 95-98% of the people that we talked with were supportive, which was very pleasing. And it tells us that what we're doing isn't in vain. We, we do want to restore Irish neutrality, we do want to restore Ireland's respect for, for human rights, and you know, people seem to be with us on this. So even though the authorities and the government insist on doing deals with the Americans and bringing militarization to Ireland, Irish people don't want this. And the more exposure we can get for the issue and the more times we can get out there on the roads, the better for us because we know that bit by bit we will turn things around. We will get the and people to start questioning exactly what's going through. We will get to a point where the, the Gardaí do their jobs and start inspecting the planes that are that are coming through Shannon. So, as I said, all in all, a very good day's, day's work, we thought. We um, weren't intent on um, spoiling anybody's day. We weren't blocking people from going to the air show. We were, as I said, reminding them that war and the fighter jets and the consequences of war are brutal, they're horrific, they're terrorizing for people and we shouldn't be part of it. So that was yesterday for us. 
Oh, that's excellent. And uh, what was the responses from, uh, uh, I heard that the uh, Gardaí chief superintendent uh, in Shannon uh, was basically making some derogatory comments uh, about the uh, 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 protesters? Yeah, basically he, he says that we're an inordinate draw on his resources. Now, we have a monthly vigil. Second Sunday of every month we'd have maybe between 10 and 30 people there. And there are probably between 10 and 30 Gardaí also there. Very often we just put their hands in their pockets or sitting in their cars looking at us because we don't intend to engage in any violent behavior. So um, they look at us, we look at them. And the Chief Superintendent, Karen, is seems intent on focusing on this and quite incorrectly and improperly saying that we're um, a problem at the, the airport. The problem at the airport are the warplanes that are coming through and are in breaches of international and national law. He claims that they're doing constant monitoring at the airport. Well, really, if they were doing constant monitoring at the airport, they'd be inspecting the military planes, they'd be inspecting the CIA rendition planes, they'd be inspecting the troop carriers, and then they'd be finding if there are war criminals and human rights abusers at Shannon Airport. That's the real problem that he should be addressing, not us. Excellent. And uh, I'd just like to quickly finish off uh, that there's been a landmark Mark uh, ruling uh, with the Shell Oil protesters that's definitely not being reported in the uh, in the news media's and uh, and that's stopping the radio shows taking the the uh, the, the sort of story on um, and uh, they're, they're basically saying this is a landmark ruling you know these people who are, who are being charged with uh, with offences to do with their activism and uh, that it's been seen that they were allowed by you know they are allowed to to make those statements and do those sorts of action uh, now I'm aware that uh, I believe uh, the plowshares uh, move movement uh, and a couple of famous TDs like Claire Daly and Mick Wallace um, have uh, are going through various court cases and some of the plowshares uh, were actually also let off. Uh, would you like to very briefly tell us about that? Yeah, uh, I'm delighted with the ruling first of all and I haven't had a chance to study it in detail but as you say the pit stop plowshares are Catholic workers five as, as they were called back in 2003 um, took an action against a, a war plane as well, which they were acquitted um, of, of doing so. Their, the, the court and their, their peers in, in the jury um, in that case um, showed that they had um, they were justified in what they did in terms of trying to end or stop war. Um, Claire Daly and, and Mick Wallace, who, who you mentioned, also gave a, a very coherent and very credible um, and important justification for what they did when they went in to attempt to inspect a warplane at Shannon. But unfortunately, the judge convicted them on the basis of some breach, breaches of a couple of bylaws because they went over a fence and they were in an area that they shouldn't be. But you know, you're right. This is a landmark decision and this is something that we're going to come back to in the case of Shannon and so many other issues around Ireland and around the rest of the world where people are standing up now, where necessary engagement in, in direct non-violent action to demand that the authorities do their jobs properly, that they look into the corporate and the militarized, um, powerful um, steamrolling of legislation and indeed of the, the, the rights and the well-being of people in order to get their will rather than doing what's best for people. Excellent. Well, I hope this uh, ruling also helps Mick Wallace and Claire Daly. Uh, we we shall have hope. to see. All right. Well, look, thank I, I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Yep. Well, okay, Sean. Thank, thank you. you so much for coming on at this short notice, and uh, we'll have this up today. And uh, um, sort of uh, good luck with your future. Uh, when is the next uh, uh, sort of uh, meet up, uh, Shannon? Second second Sunday of August, which is August the ninth at two p.m. So Excellent. give us a plug by all means when you get a chance. Well, we'll have you back on before then, God willing. Great. That's that's good. Thanks, Sean. Bye bye. Be using lawful excuse. It, we, the first to do it was Chris Cole in the UK. Where he was the first to succeed. That was, I think, in 1992. I wrote a play about him. <laughs> ah, all right. Well, uh, mm, okay. So, I mean, I suppose it'd be good to kind of open up with this topic as it's going to be on our minds. Yeah, okay. Um, and, and bearing in mind, we'll be getting Jerry in for half an hour. Yeah, please, we have Jerry. Um, I'd like to welcome you today to European News Weekly, um, to a special po podcast. Uh, we'll be talking about Shell uh, um, sort of uh, court case that occurred recently, uh, and we'll also be discussing uh, various other things. 
Uh, but I'll bring us uh, first, uh, well, obviously, the, uh, to our first guest, uh, who is involved um, with the uh, Shell case, and uh, it is uh, Donald O'Kelly. Um, now, he's a, a poet, and uh, he's uh, an actor and uh, a writer. Uh, he's uh, very accomplished in many areas. Um, he recently has also been involved, he does activist work, so he's been recently involved with the uh, Palestinian uh, uh, guard was a, a PAL fest uh, that we had in Ireland, uh, supporting the, the uh, people in Palestine and Gaza. Um, so what, we're, what, what I'd like to say is just uh, uh, welcome to the show, Donald, and uh, we'll um, start off possibly uh, by, you know, could you uh, open it up by telling us uh, about this event that happened uh, uh, and who, who else was involved and, and how you feel the uh, response uh, from uh, either the media or the alternative media was uh, to your installation. Um, uh, please go ahead, uh, Donald. Great, John. Well... Palfest Ireland was got together by a group of Irish artists. They've been working over the last few months to pull it together and it culminated in four days of events from the 8th to the 11th of July, timed to commemorate the start of the 51-day Israeli bombardment of Gaza a year ago. Um, and it comprised of over 50 arts events covering all art forms in mainly in Dublin but also throughout Ireland and involved over 400 artists directly involved in those events. So the whole idea was to create, if you like, a kind of a cultural wave of challenge to the to any acceptance of excuse for the kind of bombardment that was unleashed on the people of Gaza a year ago, which killed 2,200 Palestinians, among them 556 children. So to try to draw attention to the kind of the enormous brutality of this that seemed to be accepted worldwide as if it was somehow inevitable, we decided to put... Uh, uh, to make as big an impact as we could with an artistic image. And the image we chose was 556 infant vests upright in the sand on Sandy Mount Strand in Dublin. The reason we chose the strand was because the world had seen the four backer cousins, age 9 and 10, cut down by an Israeli gunboat rocket on Gaza Beach a year ago. So because that was an image that people could identify with, we decided to try to um, reinforce the enormity of the, uh, the brutality inflicted by Israel on the people of Gaza by putting 556 infant vests representing each of the children killed during that bombardment. And during Palfest Ireland, as well as that um, installation on the beach, we had Dr. Mads Gilbert come from, uh, from he's the Norwegian surgeon who worked in Al-Shifa Hospital in Gaza throughout the bombardment last year. And he gave his chilling testimony of the, the force uh, of the onslaught that was suffered by the people of Gaza last year. Um, it's something we're going to continue doing. Um, it made uh, quite an impact internationally, I think. It made a huge impact in Dublin itself. There was great attendance at all the uh, events we put on. And the whole idea was to raise consciousness so that to a level where it's just not acceptable to see, to, to, to harbor any excuse for that kind of uh, unilateral military aggression. Um, and it's just really, it comes down to the basic function of art, stating the truth. Right. Okay. So um, yeah, it was certainly uh, well received. I, I, I certainly noticed on Facebook there was a lot of shares going on with this. Uh, a lot of people clicking like on on the installation. I think Naomi Wolf uh, on the Daily Clout uh, picked it up, um, and uh, you know she has a reach of uh, 1.2 million and uh, 120,000 subscribers. So um, and she is the kind of uh, the, the the nub of the alternative media in uh, you know in the globe today. Um, but I, I, I suppose if we if we were to go further, I mean, what 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 other uh, what other uh, sort of activism have you been involved with? Um, and I I do notice that you uh, did a, a poem called Direct Provision uh, with um, Brian Fleming. Yeah. And uh, this was some time ago. Um, so uh, are you involved with uh, Palestinian refugees in Ireland? Um, uh, what do you know about them? What's their situation? Um, and also, uh, you know, uh, connected to your your uh, sort of uh, 
art installations and poetry uh, on this subject. But, um, uh, you know, uh, are there refugees from uh, Gaza or uh, uh, Palestine generally? In yeah, there are, mo most of whom I have only met fairly recently, to be honest, um, in, in, from getting involved with organizing Palfest Ireland. But it's been a real eye-opener for me. And um, just hoping to get to know Palestinians living in Ireland much better. Um, the direct provision uh, thing that we did was, in originally we did it in response to the introduction of direct provision, because when it came in 15 years ago, I quite honestly couldn't believe that something like this could seriously be uh, be you know enacted by by uh, politicians and and uh, officials it just seemed so brutal and um it's to our shame that 15 years later brian and i found ourselves doing it yet again to point up the fact that nothing had improved in the situation of these uh, asylum seekers living under the direct provision system in ireland in fact if anything it's possibly got worse there's been um, a working group set up that by uh, the most the current minister that uh, came out with a, a solution, so-called, to uh, the direct provision problem, as they call it. That um, that's possibly made it. See, the main function of it seems to be to uh, orchestrate a, a fast-track deportation system for those under five years in the direct provision system. So you know, if you're if if you happen to be a asylum seeker who's been longer than the ridiculous length of five years in the system, you have um, the enticement to uh, be granted refugee status and uh, to be able to settle and create a future for yourself in Ireland. If you're not, you're looking at your situation being even worse than it is currently under track provision. That's an appalling state of affairs and one that just has to be challenged whatever way uh, in whatever way is possible. So, so to clarify then, the direct provision being uh, not able to work, uh, having to live in a place, very small amount of money to live on, um, is that my, have I got the right take on it? Absolutely draconian, yeah, it's been people living on uh, 19 euro a week for the past 15 years, the amount was never increased. The, this new, uh, the, the, there's talk about uh, increasing it now, but um, it's still to a kind of ridiculously low level. And the main thing is just a kind of um, a complete denial of the really basic human rights, uh, in, including, I think, the most, probably the most important of all, which is psychologically the sense of a future. It's like it's deliberately stripping down of people so that they're denied the any feeling of having a future in the place and it was very obviously uh, constructed as a deterrent to stop word going back as the department of justice would probably see it going back home that uh, ireland is a good place to come to it was intended as a deterrent and that's why it's been kept in place for so long Right. Um, I've got one more question before, before uh, let Jimmy uh, sort of uh, come in here. But uh, concerning the issue with human rights, um, uh, do we have the European uh, Commission on Human Rights or as has the UN Rapporteur uh, to Ireland uh, uh, mentioned this uh, particular situation with uh, the refugees, all the refugees? Uh, you'd have to ask somebody more expert in the area sure. about yeah. that. Uh, but I will say um, the UN uh, Special Rapporteur, uh, Margaret Kagwa, who came to Ireland um, two years ago to study the Shell Corner Gas Project, um, came up. And no, she was actually, she did mention direct provision and also uh, the Shell Corner Gas Project as earliest requiring special um, special examination by, uh, by the UN. Um, Wow. That's what it was. It was on on both the both. They were two of the main issues that uh, she cited as um, breaches of Ireland's responsibility under international human rights um, level, internationally accepted levels of human of human rights. Okay, well, I, I have to say it's uh, uh, just brought us on to our other major topic that we wanted to discuss with you. Mm -hmm.
uh, can, do you want to take it away, Jimmy? Uh, obviously, uh, Donald was. Uh, um, uh, you gave it. Uh, did you give a statement to the court? Uh, the shell with to do with the shell uh, uh, oil uh, thing. I was um, then in Castlebar Courthouse on Wednesday, testifying on behalf of Liam Heffernan and Jerry Burke in relation to the the charges they faced. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you want to take it away, Jimmy? Uh, as if you, you, you've uh, investigated this a little bit more than I, and. Uh, I'll let you uh, take it up. Well, it's not that I've investigated. That's why I think I, I was compelled to uh, get Jerry on tonight to, to, to share his story of the event because, like, there has been a limited amount of information coming out through the uh, the mainstream papers, which obviously we get a lot of our information from. But um, but I think going back to just before we leave the, the topic of Gaza, because we do a European News Weekly spot here, and we're not going to get a whole lot of news in this week, but I did want to point out that uh, during the week... Uh, a European Parliament member, her name is Anna Miranda uh, Paz, she's from Spain, uh, and she's a member of the Galician Nationalist Bloc, and she's to sue Israel over her detention for 24 hours arrest alongside other activists protesting the Gaza blockade. Uh, interestingly enough, now she was uh, on board the, uh, the ship, the Marianne, uh, when it was uh, intercepted by Israeli uh, DIDF, I'd imagine, uh, and, uh, and 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 she's also saying that uh, there, there was uh, unnecessary violence used in the in, in the detention of people, and she ended up getting all bruised. And it it seems to be a general trend, not just in Israel, but and it was also experienced by the uh, the Shell to curb gas protesters over the years. The litany of um, of crimes committed against uh, ordinary people, young and old, men, women, it didn't seem to matter by guarantee. And it's it's just just a shocking story, really, and uh, I'm hoping we're not going to get a whole lot of time with Jerry tonight, but um, hopefully like, he, he will be able to share a little bit of what happened there over the years. Um, so, Donald, when you were testifying, um, what were you testifying in relation to? Well, <clears throat> in, on the day that the incidents took place where uh, that Jer Jerry and Liam were charged with, I had performed a play of mine, a solo play called Fanula outside the gates of the Shell site in Ahus, Eris County, Mayo. Um, it, I performed it for the security cameras because I want, didn't want Shell or the security company involved, IRMS, to um, uh, pretend that they weren't aware of the content of the play I was doing. Af shortly afterwards, I brought the play to Edinburgh where it won an award and was nominated for the Amnesty International Freedom of Expression Award, which, uh, which confirms that Amnesty International consider there is a freedom of expression problem in relation to the Shell Car of Gas project. But um, the, so I was, I was asked to testify, um, as to what uh, what I had seen on on the day, and I did that, of course, as truthfully as possible. But um, it's the fact that Jerry and Liam were uh, found not guilty unanimously by a jury calls into question loads of basic things about the functioning of the Irish state, the DPP. And the prosecution, uh, the prosecution counsel proceeded with this case. They, so much money was spent on pursuing the case, on keeping it going for six days before they withdrew the criminal damage charge, pursuing the uh, violent disorder charge for another four days before they find, like the the jury just reacts to the evidence given before them and unanimously uh, gives a not guilty verdict. It calls into question the whole functioning of the Irish state in relation to a slavish compliance and uh, with the, the sh and support of the Shell Carbon Gas Project over the past 15 years. It's the first time that there's been, because it's got, gone to a jury and because defendants used the uh, tactic of pleading lawful excuse, for, uh, um, that uh, it's the first time that this has happened in relation to Shell Corrib, and it's hugely significant. I don't think the mainstream media has copped on how significant it is yet, but when the legal eagles get to work on the uh, transcript of the case, that will become obvious over the next few days or week. Well, in, indeed. Um, indeed. I, I, I guess, I guess the, a little echo there. Sorry. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, the, the fact that there was, Sean, still got a, an echo there. Uh, sorry, mate. I'll uh, switch my Okay, I think we're good to go. So, because the, the significant fact, I think, is that because there was a jury case, now, 
juries, we, we don't often hear of jury cases in this country, even though like it should be a fundamental right in, in every yeah. case. You, usually like uh, it's just summary uh, judgments, uh, usually in a, in a district court. And um, it's everybody's right really to to, to have a, a case heard by a, a jury of, of one's peers. So this is significant. Yeah. I know. It's hugely significant. And it's kind of, I think it's very revealing the fact that the mainstream media have ignored it so far, you know, over more than 24 hours later. RTE hasn't mentioned it. And the Irish Times had a fairly ridiculous piece that just um, recited uh, the, the bare facts of the, um, the, that the defendants were found not guilty. It seemed to, it didn't do any analysis of the importance of this and the complete precedent it sets. Some of the evidence given, like, is really shocking, and it's given under oath. People, uh, the people who ran, the, 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 there's, for example, there's a company called OSL that used to do um, deliveries for Shell. Um, in relation, they would, effectively, they would give them. Um, how shall I say this uh, without getting your station in trouble? <laughs> they would give them. It's okay. You can't. Uh, get, you can't get our station in trouble. We. You. You know. This is. This is why. This is what our station is about. So feel free to to share whatever you're comfortable well, sharing. They would give uh, whatever needed to be done for Shell to drive the Shell current project through. These guys would do what they were asked to do for it. And one of the jobs they did was to uh, deliver a consignment of booze to Belmullet Garda station for Shell in return for Gardaí's involvement in heavy-handed policing of the Shell Corrup gas project and heavy-handed treatment of opponents. That's now said on oath in court and the mainstream media doesn't seem to think that that's significant. It was already the reason it was these guys were able to say it in court is that it was originally the story was, was originally broken two years ago, not by any Irish media organization, but by the Observer in the UK, by campaigning journalist Ed Vulliami. He got it out, he got the story out. Shell never sue. No libel case. The the proof was in was there for anybody to see. Now, to drive the point home, these guys uh, who did Shell's bidding for them have stated in court what they did under oath. Mm -hmm. And the jury accepted what they said to be true. And that it contributed, if you like, to the the um the 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 alarming nature, the alarming situation that local people were in down in in, in North Mayo, that they felt uh, the only option left open to them to try to draw attention to what was being done to them was to do what Liam and Jerry did. And the jury said they were right to do that. Well, that is really a stunning precedent in really, Irish legal history. It really is. And I'm also been seeing reports too that it wasn't just one incident of alcohol being delivered. We also heard that there was another consignment uh, apparently yes. picked up uh, outside Athlone. That's right, the Athlone bypass to, uh, if you like, a kind of a very revealing tactic to try to uh, cover it up, basically, by by having it in such an unusual location. It's it's like Keystone Cops, it's, it's, except it, it, it happened for real. It's, you know? cra it's crazy because it, it seems to be like, you know, if they're supplying the Gardaí with alcohol and the Gardaí are fueled up and aggressive and out of control and <laughs> on alcohol and, and you know, it, it's, yeah. it's a very, very dangerous precedent, really. Yeah. It's, it's it is. But just to be clear, this was after the events, so it wasn't, if you like, fueling them up before they went out. This was Christmas time thanks uh -huh. for your help, right. um, which in my view makes it even worse. Okay. The fact that so many Gardaí lied with this took a bribe. But that's what it is. It is yeah. And uh, said things about it, just tucked it into their the boot of their car and drove off with it. I find it just absolutely sickening, like that so many complied with it and still wear the uniform and strut around as if there's nothing wrong with that. When it's such a basic reneging of their oath, oath of um, of service to the guard of the Shia Their oath of office, and yet it goes yeah. right to the top. It's 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 scary indeed. Like we see what this this uh, weekend now. We're we're missing one of our own members here on site who was who was beaten up apparently in Trim Court the other day. Uh, brought down. He he brought back up before the judge, battered and bruised, and uh, and he was uh, sent in inside for two weeks for apparently yes. recording uh, in the courtroom and uh, he's missing now just at the minute we can't he can't be located so um, our, our thoughts are with uh, Cotty at the minute and, and we hope uh, on Monday we'll be able to find him Sean do you want to jump in here mate 
Uh, well, I, I, I don't know if, um, well, what I would like to know is that um, Shell's PR company, because you're talking about RT and all these newspapers not covering the story. Um, so what we do, we tend to look behind the scenes and say, well, who's doing the PR work for, for Shell? And there's two companies that come to mind is uh, Edelman uh, and w, WPP, uh, LLC, uh, which is uh, part of uh, Ogilvy and Matter, who've uh, recently covered up Fukushima and uh, the BP Gulf oil spill. They work for BP and they work for TEPCO or the government of Japan. So um, have you got any sort of, um, uh, sort of knowledge um, concerning um, Edelman and WPP's uh, efforts to uh, manage the situation? And of course, WPP have uh, Burston and Muller, uh, a notorious um, uh, company that uh, has been known to target activists. Um, and they're, they're actually uh, part of the Shell um, uh, WPP team. Um, now, uh, are, are you aware of any of uh, these uh, organizations uh, uh, in your... Uh... Well, to be honest, no, I, I, I didn't know of those companies before, but I'm very interested in hearing about them now, and I'm certainly going to read up more about them. A kind of strange coincidence is that the uh, the player of Fanula, that's um, about the whole Shell car of, um, gas project, and in particular about the uh, beating up of local farmer Willie Corduff in Glengad Shell site in 2009. Willie Corduff also testified in this case in Castlebar. Um, it, it's... Um, it's it's the the the, the play deals with the, like media manipulation and uh, and in particular the impossibility of um, people to be able to get uh, to, to be able local people to be able to get their complaints taken seriously by any of the state institutions so if the the case also the reveals the complete the bias of the state in relation to Shell Carlin for so long. The case of Willie Cordoff is really clear because what happened he was he was in a life threatening situation in the Shell site in Glengad. He was beaten up by masked men. The, he was um, brought to hospital. He, I saw him days, a couple of days after the incident, and I have never seen anybody who uh, was, in, well, in my experience, if you're a sentient human being, you know when people have been close to death. And I know that Willie Cordoff had been close to death in that incident, and that nobody can tell me otherwise. But the play uh, dealt a lot with that. But from the... Um, point of view of the PR executive whose job it is to uh, cover it up and to deflect media attention from it. So I had kind of unwittingly stumbled on um, the actual process that goes on all the time. I think we're seeing it in action at the moment in the uh, reluctance of the mainstream media to touch the story in Castlebar. RTE haven't mentioned the, the case and um, the Irish Times had just a very uh, matter-of-fact bare, bare bones kind of description of a uh, of the 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 verdict, but without any uh, analysis of the significance of it. So, I think um, uh, there may be um, yeah the PR companies may be um, working a little overtime at the weekend to try to make sure that the story doesn't get out. Well, it's actually only the tip of the iceberg, really, because you also have G4S. And G4S, uh, when they were doing the security operation for uh, uh, BP, you know, um, then basically they, they what the, we, we had uh, um, Charles Williams Digg, a jo Diggs, a journalist uh, from Bologna. Uh, he was investigating that, and uh, one of the activists was actually run off the road. People were very much harassed and uh, um, threatened with phone calls and lots of uh, horrible things happening there as well. It sounds like a, a, a very uh, similar pattern, uh, how these different corporations work of course G4S also although they're headquartered in the UK they actually have a, a base in Ireland as well uh, right so I don't know if they were involved in the uh, security operation uh, no the security operation is carried out by a group called IRNS which is um, set up by two former Irish Army Rangers which is like the, the kind of crack elite force of the Irish Army um, and that's uh, the, the, They've been uh, running the security in Shell Corp for 
uh, I don't know exactly how many years, but possibly for a decade, eight years. Yeah, yeah, indeed. I was just trying to get Jerry in on the call here now at the minute, but it, it, it is, it's it's quite shocking really. Uh, for, for such a small little uh, community there in the west of Ireland and the amount of uh, torment that they've been put through since 1996 with with abuse and violence. Uh, it, it's just shocking, really, that it's going on in our, in our little country. That it's, it's it's supposed to have such a great reputation worldwide. Like, but uh, we live in here, and uh, I think uh, certain communities certainly see a different side of of our country. You know. Well, it, it, they thought they'd get it in before anybody noticed, but um, it's now nearly 20 years later. And it's still not the gas still ain't pumping. So the community, does, as well as that, I would have to say the community opposing the Shell Corrib gas pipeline has done the whole, the rest of Ireland such a, um, such a favour by having to, if you like, create the manual of how you resist resource extraction companies coming into your area. And it's been of huge benefit to people campaigning against fracking, for example. Um, they really have developed a sort of a the blueprint for how how you um, how you uh, harness your community to oppose corporate greed, really, you know. They, they're an amazing bunch of people. And I must say, I feel very honoured and privileged to have got to know a lot of them over the last 10 years or so. Okay, so... Um, Donald, we're sort of trying to get Jerry in here at the minute, so I, I think what we're going to do is we're all going to have to disconnect, and um, yeah, I'll call everybody back in because uh, you'd for... probably be better off. Maybe it's better to say uh, talk to Jerry on his own. Because okay, you yes. it, 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 I've got even wrapped it up so long. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, um, uh, I think we need to do just a little round up, a thank you then uh, to Donald for, for for coming and stuff. Uh, should we do? Uh, do you want to do that, Jimmy? In, indeed, indeed, Donald. Listen, this has been. Uh, fascinating and thanks for coming in and it, it's been a strange synchronicity in having you on Donald I didn't realise your connection to the Shell Corp uh, trial there during the week and uh, it's been serious synchronicity yeah. there so I uh, very much appreciate it and, and thanks for coming on and, and, and sharing uh, the, the information and, and well done for putting that, uh, that event on in, in Dublin on Sandy Mount Beach uh, what, what's it called again I have uh, Palfest Palfest so Palfest Ireland yeah Palfest. that was one event oh over 50. <laughs> oh, God. Of course, uh, yeah. Palfest is on uh, Facebook. And do you have a website yeah. you'd like to call out? Palfest Ireland. There, there is a Palfest a literary festival in Palestine already. But we're Palfest Ireland. And, uh, yeah, there's a website as well, pal, pal, palfestireland.net. Fantastic. Thank you so much for being here and uh, right. sharing your stories. And uh, we'll get Jerry in now. and He can give us the, uh, uh, the sort of the view from the dock, I suppose. Great. Thumbs up to Jerry. <laughs> see you. See you, see you, Donald. Oh, wow, Sean. Uh, amazing listening back to that. Uh, sometimes uh, when you're on the call, uh, it's it's hard to pick it all up sometimes, but uh, fantastic listening back to Donal O'Kelly there. That, that's serious, serious. Uh, uh, a gentleman, I have to say. It's a fantastic report. Uh, you know, he's done some great stuff, and he was all over Naomi Wolf's uh, page. She loved his uh, his uh, Palestine uh, sort of uh, uh, art piece of artwork that he did on the uh, thing uh, on the beach, which was 558 young children's T-shirts to represent the 558 children that were um, sort of murdered, basically in Palestine, in my opinion, uh, in Gaza uh, last year. So um, we've got that one then, and uh, you know, he, he, obviously, then we, we we've got Jerry coming up next. We've who, got Jerry up, yeah, yeah. And this and, is this uh, is not going to be an easy one, Sean, because um, uh, because uh, what we didn't realise at the time, uh, Jerry's got a, uh, quite quite a, a quite a strange dialect, and uh, we we unfortunately we had to edit some of it out, um, but uh, we we did manage to uh, uh, it, it did clear up for the second half of it, but we were just afraid that the first half would have been a little bit uh, too much of a strain to listen to but I, I would urge you just to to listen very closely you, you have to understand it was over a mobile phone the connection wasn't great and uh, I think Jerry was getting uh, little echoes and artifacts down at his end uh, he suspected a uh, foul play also uh, um, but uh, he, the but the bits that were missed I think I can summarize it just a little bit where he's describing uh, a lot of the violence that was uh, perpetrated on the people of Ahus uh, which is in Sligo in around the, the, the Shell 
Corrib, uh, the proposed Shell Corrib uh, gas field and the gas pipeline, uh, and he was relaying stories about how the the, the sea was foaming and bubbling up, and uh, there was big holes appearing in the sand, and they were going in and measuring depths and stuff, and uh, he was noticing how dangerous it, it was and how dangerous it looked, especially to children if they managed to fall in, and the possibility that they could have been lost uh, in the sludge. Uh, possibly uh, created by uh, we don't know what. Uh, obviously, like uh, there was something that sounded like uh, breaches in pipelines, maybe, and uh, and high pressure of some sorts. Um, but it, it, that's only speculation at this moment. I think he he tried to they tried to highlight the issues to the council, uh, and those uh, issues and, and 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 concerns went unheeded. So, but unfortunately, uh, we had to edit some of that out because it was very very hard to listen to. So, but we'll pick it up in the middle of the interview. Do you think, Sean, that was a, a fair enough uh, a summary? Sure, I think you, you got you got most of the points there, um, and uh, I uh, I would say, was there some other, something else there as well? Um, Wasn't there? Uh, uh, was he speaking about how they were being tracked and followed by the uh, IRMS? Exactly. Surveillance. Yeah, yeah. He was yeah. he discussed that a little bit on and off, and uh, <clears throat> as as our report uh, from Charles Williams Diggs on the BP oil spill. We were seeing incredibly similar types of actions by security services in harassment and uh, uh, techniques, basically, on, on the activists, as well as, obviously, the violent techniques that they were using. Uh, and, and we were hearing about this um, in the BP oil spill, uh, and we've heard similar types of uh, pressures being put on the people of Fukushima um, with the same uh, PR companies organizing similar security companies to do the kind of same thing. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, I would I would say, you know, obviously this, this uh, interview, as we go through it, we start discussing uh, it, what he's talking about in terms of uh, the clarity we, w we were able to uh, glean uh, some some information out of it, and uh, but the the actual phone quality was so bad, um, and uh, it, it was very difficult with the heavy accent to yeah. to uh, get it, and that was the worst uh, connection we had, wasn't it? So, it it, it was, but the whole podcast will be there. It will be uploaded. It will be there, available, and uh, we, did, we just done this for for the sake of live radio and for our listeners. Um, but yeah. listen, Sean, we better get a move on because we're really running out of time, and we still got uh, we've got three more interviews to do. So. <laughs> so um, okay. So what you're saying then basically is that um, that you've got several different types of security companies uh, in operation, and um, there's no accountability. They're they're basically driving around your homes uh, at night, harassing people. I did pick up on a few of these stories as I was reading about them, like people getting followed around by Gardaí as they were trying to go about their everyday business. So I think. Oh, that, that, that. That would be normal. That that would be. I know it's not normal anywhere in any city in the world or any city in this country, but that would be normal here. It's only two weeks ago. Um, a journalist came from Dublin and he was back at the guy taking pictures of seeing you know, have a little one much to see to see because the uh, compound was cleared out. But Seneca, the security company, which were I R M S, followed them for three miles, driving behind them, watching them. There was tourists home last year and they also followed them. So R M S yeah. did you you mentioned R M S there. So they they I R M S in but IRMS, uh, who, which is owned by Jim Farley, they changed their name and they have an umbrella group that say the, the top umbrella is now Seneca. Sen they, Seneca. 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 Yeah, Seneca Security. And they drive around the van and if you were back there taking pictures or doing this or doing that, they send the funny you. Okay, okay. That's it's good. It's it, it is astounding. Like uh, Sean, do you, um? I think Sean may be having a little bit of trouble with your with your dialect. But Sean, do you want to jump in here with, with any questions? Or oh, I, I talk slower if that helps. Uh, oh, that'd be brilliant if you could. I think it's part really because of the the connection and because yeah. uh, I'm a dumb Englishman. <laughs> That's the other. Ah, uh, well, yeah. I have, I lived in your country for a long time, and I had no problem with you. Well, uh, I, I have a problem with the English now, but anyway, it's <laughs> complicated. All right, okay. <laughs> All right, okay. Well, I picked up on a couple of things you were saying there, and one of them was the Statoil issue and, and to do with Norway, Norway's sovereign fund. Um, and, of course, uh, 
yeah so so that's interesting i've, I've got kids in norway and uh this this uh, uh radio podcast is uh what is one of the places it would be uh going towards is is norway as well um and uh so so that's an interesting uh point you make up uh, and 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 do you know if um there are any plans by any activists to go to statoil and to the norwegian government and discuss oh, uh, how they're they doing have, there um a local group from here has already gone to Norway. Uh, Willie Cudduff was one of them. P.J. Morden was another one of them. All local people like myself. Now, I didn't go myself because at the time I had other things on. I couldn't go. But they went and they met um, with that oil. So you could they do anything with what was going on here. They met members of the government. And uh, the Norwegian people themselves, they're very much in favor of trying to sort out they're ashamed of their company being involved in the car of gas and all the controversies that surround it because I believe in Norway, Statoil is very much respected and they, you know, they're you they a state-owned company and they're, they're very much respected for the good that they do. And yeah. the Norwegian people are ashamed at what they're doing here. But at the end of the day, it comes down to the point where we have a government in Ireland how come they're allowing this to happen? When everything is trashed out and all the rest of it, this is the bottom point that comes out. The bottom sure. point is, we have a great system here in Norway. We're proud of We're proud of satire. How come you don't have a system yourself? How come your government is allowing this to be done for its own people? And we can't answer that question. We, we well, it may have something to do with people. the jobs. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, it may have something to do with the jobs that they'll be offered when they uh, retire from public uh, po uh, uh, politics life, I just imagine. Yeah, it seems to be uh, a common thread that's going on through the police force and uh, here the Gardaí here and everything. Like when they retire, they get a job with security firm just working for Shell. Now, they have no shame, like they're not even trying to hide the fact. You know, they're doing it openly. We you're talking about the violence here, are you? The violence? Well, what I'm talking about is, like, if you're a guard and you're throwing me into a grain and you retire, and next week I see you walking for IRMS, it wouldn't give you a whole lot of confidence in our police service here. If you can leave the guards and join the people the sign to kill you, well, there's not a lot of difference. There's no difference in my mind. They're hand and glove. They're walking together. The state, IRMS, and Shell. They're interdependent because there's so much bribery and corruption behind between them. You know, this just has to change. It has to be. Yeah. Well, we had we had Charles Williams Diggs on um, from who who was a journalist covering the BP oil spill, and I I I picked up on the fact that you were basically um, having people that were being followed, harassed late at night. Oh, and these, okay. yeah, and all, all these types of uh, uh, strategies are employed by well, in in the, for B, uh, during the BP Gulf Oil spill, it was G four S. Um, yeah. But, uh, are they, do you know if they're involved with the uh, shell? Uh, I don't know. You see, see, I don't know. But all I know is the guys driving around and blackout keeps blackout in the bloodless. If you pull up, they're not they're advertising themselves. Uh huh. They're not no, no, they're, no, they're not. No, they pull up maybe. Oh, maybe 100 yards away from you, and if you approach them, they'll just speed up. Right, and um, oh. that, that's the kind of harassment they do to, to frighten people. And uh, I was going to ask also, because, you know, with RMS, they, they were spying on activists. They were um, intercepting mobile phones, emails, um, and uh, many you... other surveillance techniques. And uh, did you um, have any of that happen to you at all? Even as I'm talking to you now, and even as I'm talking to enemies that ring me, my phone is tapped. I don't know how I prove it, but the only way I know it's tapped is they're very bad at doing it because there's a huge echo in your phone when you're talking. If I rang Maura Harrington, if I rang Willie Cadot, if I rang P.J. Morton, if I rang Liam, there's this mad echo in my phone. But if I rang some... If I rang some number out of the paper, it isn't in it. But um, uh, we know for a long, long time, either the state or security company or somebody is tapping our phones. We can't approve it, but we know it's been done. It's common knowledge here that we've been monitored in every possible sense that we can. Sure. It's, um, it's sad. It's, it's the way of life now, folks. We're, just, we, like, we're not surprised now, Bob. Um, I'm still 
like they offered, like before, two years ago, before I ever went to court, was just before they ever went to courthouse in the Muller court, and they were trying to the same thing in the Muller court. And so the approach met to me, and the approach was, and it was off the record, and the approach was, if you pay a fine of 250 euros, you sign a piece of paper saying that you won't protest being shot again, and the, the court or the guards will never collect the money as long as you sign a thing saying that you won't protect as a car of really? And my answer to them was, if you think that my family and my home is worth only 250 euros, and you want to buy my silence for 250 euros, I said, you're mad, because if you have 250,000 or 250 million euros, you're not going to buy my silence, because if you do it to me, you're going to do it everywhere else, and I'm not going to be responsible for that. No. And I think, in really fact, actually, with the BP Gulf oil spill, they were doing that, they, and they're still doing it today. So it's it's just part of the uh, the normal uh, way they do things. Um, I have to say, in terms of your phone quality, we're talking to a landline, which should be crystal clear. And yes. there is you definitely that now, uh, issues with the audio. Yeah, do you, do you hear that kind of thing there? That always happens. Yeah. yeah, it's quite quite unusual that they're messing with your phone. Uh, Edward Snowden said that they can do that without having echoes and what have you. So um, that's quite uh, quite interesting. Oh yeah, that's what they're at. It's a huge echo because when you're talking, you can hear yourself talking while you finish talking, which is totally unusual. Yeah, an echo. You know, yeah, an echo. Yeah. So, so a lot of my friends say the same thing about that how we copped it. So I guess um, because we're we're near near the uh, 30 minute mark I think um, is there anything that you'd like to finish the show up on uh... this this be what I want is I want uh, the allegations that OSL OSSL made about yeah, and I believe them drinking the, the money gather station and the drink being delivered to the garden diving unit in that loan and they gave drink the met on the bypass and gave drinks to the diving club in that loan, the garden diving club in that loan. It needs to be investigated properly. And um, they have given the names of the garden the Honoda drink. It's time to do something. With it. And the deal or the Irish people has to change, has to change. And uh, this gas has to be out to see it. And all the corruption and historical finances involved in carbon gas has to be exposed. Our country, our state is rotten. And sorry to say that it's rotten. And it's only last week it was exposed again in Anna, more brightly. They said it never happened again. They did it. They did it. Sure. Have, have you um, had any press uh, contact you at all? Um, I'd say if you're dead or if you're in the graveyard, there's some more activity. It's a story that they don't want to know about because there's just too many dead people that's going to fall with this with legs and grow. There's nobody contacts me whatsoever. This is a thought radio interview I don't want anybody. The RT it was on Midwest Radio. I rang Midwest Radio yesterday and they said to me, If it was a new paper tomorrow, we'll run with it. But seeing that it's not today, we can't do anything. They hadn't even, they weren't even curious, but it's not that, the Shell has them in their pocket. Shell bought the media, and that is just the way it is, they, you know, but it, there's only one thing they can't buy, and that's how it is, they can't buy it. Yeah, well said, that's well said, and right. we'll try and get it out there for you. Do you want to roll oh, up? I know that. So, uh, do you want to finish up there, Jimmy? Well, I think I'll finish up with this. Um, Jerry, Jerry Burke and uh, Liam Herpenen, I'd like to thank you for your courage and uh, your forthrightness in, 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 and with what you've done. You, you showed no fear and you went in there, you peacefully uh, made your points and uh, you got put through the organ grinder and you come out s s smelling of roses. And uh, I'd like to thank you anyway from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of everybody at the station for your courage and for, and for doing what's right. Well said. Thank Thanks very, thanks very much for having me on. So, All right. God, God bless you, my friend. God bless you. Talk to you guys. Indeed. Hopefully. Uh, Bye-bye. Well, that wasn't too bad in retrospect, the second half, Sean, and uh, he was very, very brave men there, and uh, fair play to them. And fair play for you to, to spending so much long in the early hours of this morning trying to edit it to make uh, it uh, hearable. Well, look, at, you know, uh, I think there's the least we can do for, 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 for Jerry and Liam, so, um, sure. and I think we're really, really pushing for time here. And, right. and Quick takeaway from that from me. 
Yeah, uh, Norwegian uh, sovereign fund. When they went over there, the Norwegians were saying that the Irish must be mad giving their uh, res resources away yeah. and not doing what Norway did, invest it in the social democratic uh, uh, sort of uh, country that they have. Exactly. Anyway. Exactly. No, that's a, that's a good point. Um, so um, we oh. also have another pre-record here. Now we, we've got a quick uh, four minutes and 37 seconds in with Stephen Manning with a quick update on what happened in the courts uh, in Dublin there during the week. So will I go ahead and play play that one? Yeah, far away, right, mate. And uh, this is Jimmy Hagen and Sean McGee uh, with European News Weekly. And uh, I'd like to welcome Stephen Manning, who has come in to give us a quick update on what happened in the court on Wednesday at the High Court in Dublin. So welcome, Stephen. Welcome back to our show. Thanks very much, Jimmy and Sean. Nice to talk to you again. Um, to get straight into matters there, Jimmy, uh, first of all, it wasn't actually the High Court. I just want to clarify this. It's the um, District Court uh, in uh, the Bridewell, or at the police station behind the Four Courts. And for those people who may not know the difference, the District Court is the first level court uh, in Ireland. It usually deals with uh, relatively minor offences, criminal offences, that is, um, such as um, uh, traffic offences. Now, I had received five summonses, uh, which I'm saying are absolutely ridiculous, preposterous and vexatious. The timing of them and the circumstances under which they were delivered to me uh, raise a few questions as well. Uh, the timing issue for a start, uh, the alleged offence, minor traffic offence, occurred in um, September last year. I had no notification whatsoever about it and all of a sudden, uh, according to my children, there was a guard of car turning up at the house practically every day over a period of a week until eventually they caught me in and handed me these summonses. Now, normally the procedure is to post them. Uh, they did not post them. And uh, one wonders if the fact that I recently discovered that mail that was coming from a solicitor friend of mine was being returned to him undelivered with the envelope marked moved away had anything to do with this. So we've, we've got problems with our postal system. We've got problems with the processes by which some of this is being delivered. Uh, as you already know, I was I was informed by another local court that I'd missed a hearing, which I was never told about either. And in my absence, I was found guilty of an offence and fined and warned that I would be arrested uh, if I did not um, pay the fine. I'm dealing with that as well as best as I can. But in this uh, court anyway last week, in Dublin. Uh, the only notable uh, issue here is that I turned up, we had a good number of Integrity Ireland supporters there, and we, uh, the, but the guard, the prosecuting guard, the policeman who was supposed to be issuing the summonses, wasn't there. Now, we were told later that we had some family emergency, but um, this didn't seem to stop the judge striking out a whole number of cases, except when he came to mine, mine was moved back to second call. We did walk forwards, as we're learning to do now more often, I walked forwards to the front of the court and apologised for interrupting the court, but I wanted to know why my, my matter was being held back. And the long and the short of it is, is that the judge then directed me to come back in November, which will be another day out of my life. I suggested that he should guarantee that our expenses are paid, since it's not our fault, but the fault of agents of the state that the matter didn't go ahead. Uh, when I asked him to guarantee our expenses, uh, as I said earlier, it, uh, you'd have thought I was asking for the head of his firstborn on a plate or something, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, clearly, they're not used to lay and standing up and asserting our rights. So the, the, the end result of that is that we do have to go back now in November and uh, we'll deal with that then, but uh, the one good thing about it is that we'll be even better prepared when we do. And, uh, no, I just, uh, sorry, sorry, Stephen, for interrupting you. I, I was just saying, you know, this seems to be uh, a sort of this harassment, if you like to call it that, is uh, seems to be uh, because of possibly uh, of uh, the recent Joe Ducey incidents. Uh, can, can you uh, give us some feedback about that? Uh, yes, uh, cer yes uh, certainly, Sean. Yeah. Um, and again, very briefly, uh, the Joe has appointed me his power of attorney, which means I have the right to speak on his behalf, certainly dealing with the authorities up to a certain level, uh, up to that actually representing in court, which I, I wouldn't be able to do. But uh, I wrote a letter which is posted on the Integrity Ireland website, a public letter. I wrote it to the Dara Commissioner. And I asked for details on the operation. And I mean, I do mean the operation. Now, everybody else has been referring this to the incident where Joe was accused of a hit and run incident. It wasn't. It was an operation. There was uh, one, two, two vehicles, two guard vehicles that were involved in trailing uh, Joe before the incident. There were two more posted at his house. I've asked for those details. They have sent my letter on to the Garda Ombudsman. In other words, they are refusing to give us the details. It's not good enough. And they are now complicit in an offence against the administration of justice, which is something that we do intend to follow up on. Over to you guys. 
Well, thank you very, very much, Stephen, for coming in and uh, giving us that quick update. I know it's uh, it's been it's it's very, very short, but uh, d tomorrow's show is kind of full as it is. And uh, but again, uh, w hopefully, we can have you back soon. Looking forward to it. Thanks very much. Thank you, Stephen. No, uh, yeah, it, it is. It's a little bit of a rush, uh, Sean, with everything today, trying to fit it all in. And uh, I think it's looking like we might, if we play our cards right, we might get one or two minutes at the at the end of our next uh, our next pod. Well, that would be good. So um, I suppose we we'll just crack on with this one for really a motive uh, um, plea for help from from uh, activists. And uh, uh, anyway, we'll let that roll. I think, and it speaks for itself. Yeah, it certainly does. Right, uh, today on European News we have a very quick uh, uh, interview with uh, Ashleen Lowe, who is speaking on behalf yeah. of the health painter, uh, Tony Roachford. Uh, so, Ashleen, um, uh, he, he's on a hunger strike at the moment, but could, could, could you give us first the, just a, a very quick synopsis of, of what he's campaigning about? Well, basically, Tony is campaigning about um, faulty heating systems in more than 100,000, maybe 500,000 homes plus in Ireland um, that are making uh, children, um, adults, elderly people very ill with toxins that's going through the drinking water um, from um, a faulty valve that's been used all through the country with these heating systems. And um, he, he's been trying to highlight his issue for the past three years and the government or the Oireachtas committees that he's done this with are choosing not really to pay much attention to it. So he, he, he found that this was his final step in getting them to listen Thanks, and, take it, and, and take his issue very seriously because at the end of the day, it's the lives here that are at risk. Indeed, Ashley. Um, so we were supposed to be talking with Tony today uh, personally, uh, but um, we're finding out now uh, that he's feeling not so well. So would you would you be able to give us an idea of how Tony is right now and and the state of his health? Tony um, is refusing all liquid and he's refusing all food. Tony is very weak. Um, he can he can barely lift his legs out of bed. He's very very weak, and um, I'm in fear for my best friend's life. My friend's dying, and um, it's 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 very hard for his wife. It's very hard for his family. And um, I, I I don't really know what else to say. But this is this is really this is really really. It's a serious, serious state of affairs now at, at, at this stage. Um, just, uh, considering the uh, phone call from the uh, from the president uh, this morning, uh, how do you feel about his response then to uh, to your pleas? Um, I, th I, th I think we're all very, very um, disappointed because he's meant to be the most powerful man in in the country alongside the Taoiseach and he, he should be able to maybe respond in, in, a, in a better way than just saying we just hope that Mr. Rochford will eat or take water very soon. Um, but basically, it's out of my power, which is, it's, it's, it's not right. It's just, it's wrong. Because at the end of the day, Tony is trying to save lives, and now he's actually put his own life at risk. And we worry that his issues um, and his knowledge will never get out there if anything happens to him. Sean, anything that you'd like to add in here? We're at the three and a half minute mark and we're, we're running tight on time. So. Yeah. Sure. Um, I'd just like to, well, two questions. First is, uh, how is he uh, physically at the moment? He's not good. He's not good. He's not very good at all. How many days has he been uh, on hunger strike in total? Three. This is day three. Today is day three, where he's still refusing water. He's still refusing some food. Right, and uh, he wasn't very well to begin with either. He he had lost. He had lost at least oh, oh I'd say roughly at least two stone of, of body weight before he decided to do this. This was his last his last attempt of of getting them to take him seriously and and you know listen to his issues about these faulty heating systems going into people's houses that effectively are poisoning people in their homes. Right. So, uh, 
basically he obviously it becomes much more dangerous if he doesn't drink uh, water um, it is and, and, and all all his family his friends were all around him we have we pleaded we begged him and he he's a very headstrong person and he's always been a fantastic activist if anybody knows Tony he's a fantastic activist and um we've we've tried we've tried everything and he's refused he's refused he's he's not taken any fluids or food well, and uh, is he getting any sort of uh, medical help um well he he has refused medical he has refused medical help um but i think i think as 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 his family and and friends we're going to have to step in and maybe take that matter into our own hands eventually right so uh obviously it's uh yeah this is uh, not good news we will no. try and get get the message out to people uh for you and i, I hope that uh, that would encourage him to at least start drinking water again with maybe some lemon and uh, uh there's various yeah. advice that can be found on the web on, on breaking a, a hunger strike um, yeah, yeah. And advice on how much water needs to be drunk each day to take out toxins. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah. I do. So I do hope that this uh, this radio uh, interview will will do some of that. Um, yeah. Have you have you got anything else to say, um, Ashley? Um, I I just like to say on behalf of um, myself and Noel, Tony's wife, that um, that um, we're very grateful for all the Facebook support and Twitter Twitter support. People have been very kind and, and very concerned for, for Tony's welfare and well being. And um I just want to say thanks very much for, for all the people who have supported them. Okay. Um, and there's, have the, there's there's been a lot of people so Sure. And have the press uh, been in contact with uh, with you or anyone? No, not not as of yet, no. Oh, dire. There's so much that they're missing out on, we're finding. But yeah. um, we'll get the message out. So we're, we're quite well connected with an activist people around the world. And yeah. uh, you can be sure that uh, that his, uh, his uh, campaign has been highlighted. And I hope he takes heart out of this if he's listening to this. Um, yeah. you know, this, this. He's got to come up with a strategy that gives uh, the social media time to pick up on the story and, and run yeah. with it and, and get, get the facts out. He needs to do uh, interviews explaining what the issue is. And uh, we're, we're fully behind him. And we, our hearts, both, I'm sure I speak for Jimmy as well, our hearts go to you and, uh, and his wife. Uh, and, and yeah. friends and family um, and yeah. uh, we, we hope that uh, by doing this that, that maybe um, he, he will uh, think more strategically about his campaign um, so yeah. that we can, we can support him. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hope so, but uh, as I said, Tony, Tony is a very strong-willed person, so it's, it's very hard, it's, it's very hard to, to change, to change his mind and um, but but we'll keep trying because, as I said, like all his family and his friends are here around him now. So he, we're here to support him and whatever decisions he decides to make. Well, please let him know that we're here to support you all. So, and support well, you. that's that's very nice to know, and and thanks very much. Okay, thanks, Ashley. Uh, and uh, I'd also like to, if to, if Tony does actually get to listen to this, I'd like to plead him also to uh, start drinking some fluids and uh, extend his campaign because uh, yeah. it, it sometimes takes time for these matters to take a little bit of traction. So, uh, Tony, if you listen to this, drink a bit of water, please. Yeah. Yeah. So, Ashley, um, um, I, I, I think we're going to have to tie this up now, and uh, okay. I, I, I really That's appreciate grand. you coming on and giving us the background. And uh, no problem, uh, Sean. Anything no you'd like problem. to say before we? Uh, well, uh, do you um, mind if we, we keep a track of uh, of the progress on that over the next week? That's that's no problem at all. Yeah, hopefully, so hopefully, much. hopefully he be he he he'll come out with this good, you know. And, and do you have well, a Facebook well, we uh, page that you could uh, call out actually for people to get updates? Um, well, there's my my own Facebook account, um, Ashling Low. That's A S H L I N G L O W E. A S H L I N G L O W E. I've been putting I've been putting updates on it every day. So excellent. Grand. Okay. Well, we'll uh, we'll we'll uh, certainly be contacting you through there, uh, Ashling. Thank you so much. No problem. Well, that's a tough story, uh, Sean, and I, I do hope 
Tony uh, does start at least drinking a bit of fluids anyway. In the meantime, it's, it's not nice to hear that. Yeah, I know. It's, that's pretty bad. Um, I, I would like to say one quick thing. Um, and it's basically, can, you know, and it is to Tony as well, that uh, it, people that did hunger strikes in medieval times would go to the gates of the castle and they would, uh, they would go on hunger strike. The kings inevitably would bow to pressure because they didn't want the embarrassment of, uh, of, of that situation. They would come up with a solution, a positive solution. But the president uh, who contacted them, he, he's just totally ignored this issue, yeah. um, which shows a certain callousness, uh, which uh, I'm quite uh, surprised about. Um, yeah. But, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. And please, Tony, uh, extend your campaign, um, and we'll be there for you. Indeed, Sean. So, listen, um, I want to thank you again for for uh, another full-on Sunday, it's been it's been a bit of a mission. It's been a marathon of a, a couple of days. So, Sean, uh, chat to you during the week, I guess. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for your hard work. My Indeed. Friend. And thanks to everyone in the chat box. Oh, I am up next. Yeah.